Good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the Insight 7 seminar. My name is Peter Cochran. I'm going to actually be doing the talk today, um, but I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event takes place and pay respect to the Elders past, present and future. Um, so thank you, as I said. Um, I'm going to provide the presentation. At the end we're going to have Sonia from Insight will be um, taking control of any questions that you might have um, to wrap it up at the end of the day. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm a, uh, my substantive position is a clinical nurse consultant here at Biala with the um, acute care service on ground floor and the needle and syringe program. However, for the last two years I have been uh, working on a project um, rolling or implementing opioid substitution treatment into the Queensland Correctional Centres and that's what the talk is about today. So um, it's called uh, connecting the dots and I kind of thought about that because for me it was um, a look at the fact that we do provide opioid treatment services uh, throughout Queensland um, as throughout Australia but some of the points have been missing so we don't have a complete picture yet and one of the big parts of that has been the lack in correctional centres over a number of years so you're all aware that um, the opioid treatment space in involves regulation and policy um, we have support systems in public um, system, there's ATODs, IS, things like that to help us do what we do. Um, and we also have treatment service delivery, so whether it be in public clinics, private clinics, private prescribers, or at pharmacies where people are going and getting their doses. So there's many parts to complete the picture. We also rely on, um, patients rely on being able to access treatment when they go into services such as hospitals and now correctional centres. So. Today I'm just going to kind of, I know that there might be some people in the audience that aren't aware of opioid uh, treatment or tr treatment of opioid dependence, so I'm going to actually just give a really 101 on that, it's very 101, probably just 01 actually. Um, then we're going to go into the background of why we got into, uh, why I'm at this project, putting uh, the treatment into correctional centres. We're going to have a look at some of the clinical aspects that are probably relevant for people um, working clinically. And then we're just going to, um, I'm going to wrap up of how we've, where we're at right now, um, as of today, and some of the challenges and enablers that we've had to get there and what it's going to look like in the future. Um, I think, I'm not sure what the standard is. I'm normally fine for people to ask questions as we go, but at... Um, yeah, it's up to you, otherwise. You do it at the end, but it is up to you. Okay. Uh, typically, I'm fine for questions just at the end, but if you do have anything as we go, please um, just call out and I'll, I'll interrupt and clarify things for you. Sorry about that. So, um, opioid treatment. Really, what we're talking about here, getting back to basics of opioids, so we know that we're talking about things like heroin and in pharmaceutical op opioids, things like oxycodone, morphine, fentanyl, codeine products as well. Um, a lot of information in media about them more recently. Um, we're seeing there's a lot of increase in uh, pharmaceutical opioid prescription and the fact that there are a lot of um, our drug related deaths do um, indicate that pharmaceutical opioids are the uh, most predominant substance there. So we have heard a lot about them. Um, we know that regular use of opioids can lead to dependence and a couple of those features of dependence are craving and withdrawal, feature, uh, withdrawal syndrome as well when people cease to use or reduce the amount of opioids that they're using. So providing people with opioid treatment um, helps to reduce those cravings and to um, reduce the effects of the withdrawal. So what we're aiming for um, is a person who's receiving appropriate care, so a dose that's suitable to them. They're not in withdrawal, they're not intoxicated. They're participating in society for whatever that means for them, whether it's work, um, family involvement, relationships, engaging in the way that they would like to, and provides them with health benefits as well. So we look to reduce that unsanctioned opioid use of the stuff that we, that's causing problems for people and other drug use as well. We want to reduce mortality from overdose and as I say that's one of the big issues that we're seeing in the news regularly. Um, transmission of bloodborne viruses is a very important aspect of having treatment, improving health and wellbeing and there is the aspect as well of reducing drug related crime. 
Um, and that's why it's an important feature of what we're looking at now, getting into correctional centres, because people do um, are involved. People using opioids regularly um, do have a, um, a higher risk of being involved in crime-related activity. So, in Queensland, how does it look? It's been going for a long time. It's provided in public clinics and private um, prescribers. Different states have different uh, systems in place. So for instance, in Victoria, most of you probably be aware that a lot of it is run from private prescribers and they don't have the public health um, clinic system that we might have up here. Other uh, states also have a bit of a hybrid system as well. Ours is hybrid, we do have the, um, the private prescribers out there as well and I'll give you some statistics on that in a minute. Um, we don't have a restriction to access, but they need to be opioid dependent or a previous diagnosis of dependence. We also don't put a restriction on how long someone can remain in the program. Quite often we know that people want to reduce off fairly quickly because they want to get back into um, to their lives as they were before their problems that arose with opioid uh, use. Um, but we don't push them on that because we know that the longer they're in treatment, the um, higher rate of success that they will have. And generally in Queensland, the dosing is through community pharmacies, which comes with a, a dispensing fee for patients as well. And of course it's voluntary, so we don't uh, force anyone to be on the program. So pharmacotherapies that we use for um, opioid treatment, methadone, buprenorphine and buprenorphine naloxone. So I guess the key feature there for all of them is that they, are, they have long half-lives. Um, it's a feature of the treatment in that it relieves that that it gives relief from the craving and the withdrawal symptoms that they go through when they're, if they start to um, reduce their other opioid use and that enables them to engage uh, in those important aspects of their life like I was talking about before. Um, and just the uh, presentation of these and I guess um, I've put that up there because it is important to, um, I, it's important in that correctional centre because of the, I guess, the complexities of providing the service in there. The fact that methadone um, comes in a form of syrup and liquid, uh, buprenorphine in either a tablet or the film preparation. Um, and as you are all probably aware, the new long-acting injectable preparations as well. It's another talk for another person, um, but obviously people are watching the space to see how that rolls out. And just on the correctional side of things, I'll throw in there that there's certainly a trial going on in New South Wales at the moment using a long-acting buprenorphine preparation to see how it actually fits and works within the correctional environment. Okay, so methadone, um, widely used in research, um, we have used it for many years. But some of the things that um, to, to keep in mind, and I suppose I put these up here more particularly around the environment that we're looking at with the correctional environment, it can be difficult to titrate. So we have that start, start low and go slow. We know that there are risks involved with people that might be increased on doses too quickly. Um, the, the number of drug interactions that can occur as well can be problematic. And it's daily dosing. So we talked before how they're all a uh, long act, they have long half-lives, and so that's great because it allows people to get on with um, other activities. But in this instance, just to keep in mind, it's still daily dosing. And that does impact in a correctional centre environment. I know it does in the community, even more so in correctional centres. Um, and your buprenorphine uh, preparations. So safer, particularly in that overdose situation, but you still need to be careful when we're combining it with other medications that are um, CNS depressants as well. But we can actually get them up into a stable dose a lot faster than you can with methadone, and that's a, a useful thing. There is the opportunity to double and triple dose, but experience probably tells, that, that tells us that most people, um, while they try that, it doesn't really necessarily work for them but less withdrawal noted when people are reducing off of this than, than methadone, and certainly less drug-drug interactions, which again in this environment um, can be a, um, an attractive feature. Um, it, often people might think that buprenorphine has, and the buprenorphine products, uh, carry with them a little less stigma in community when dosing on them in their treatment. It's not necessarily so in the correctional environment. Um, you might realise, or you might have heard about the uh, for instance, even in March this year at Woodford Correctional Centre, they intercepted someone that was trying to introduce Suboxone into the, um, the correctional centre. They were trying to um, take in 721 strips, uh, which 
they had val evaluated at about $290,000 of value um, when in the correctional centre. So in, in that setting, in the correctional centre and the people working in there, Suboxone doesn't necessarily come with a reduced stigma because it is a drug that is um, commonly um, introduced into correctional centres and so they're already seeing problems with um, that medication. Um, and when you, when within the correctional centres as well, there is also the issue of, and, and some experience, and certainly what has happened in some other states, experience of some diversion with buprenorphine as well. Um, however, there are a number of drugs that are um, diverted in correctional centres, and it's not just these treatment drugs. Certainly, um, you know, I've talked to um, to people. There is a quite a, uh, you know a trade of, of other medications as well, whether they be for their um, you know, depression or other treatment of, of other issues that they have. So it's not just these drugs that get diverted in the correctional environment. That's just to bring you all back to give you something to look at rather than listen to me talk. Methadone, buprenorphine, um, naloxone in the film, and the fact that that one there gets uh, placed sublingually um, which again I'll come back to for this setting just because of the uh, the requirements of dosing in the setting. So opioid treatment in Queensland or in Australia I'm going to give a, a, a quick overview of what NOPSAD 2018 told us. So um, NOPSAD is the National Opioid Pharmacotherapy Statistics Annual Data Collection. They look at a snapshot day across the country. Um, doesn't happen on the same day in every jurisdiction, but we're looking at who is being treated uh, with pharmacotherapy, who is treating, so the prescribers, and where are they getting their, their doses, so the dosing points. So last year there was 50,000 people in Australia, roughly, a bit over, um, receiving opioid treatment. In Queensland we had 7,000 or just under 7,000. More males and females, so about two-thirds males. Um, also about two-thirds of them are aged between 30 and 49 years. The 40 to 49 is the largest age cohort that we have and we're also seeing an increase over the, in the over 60 bracket as well. But that's something we've been seeing a trend in an ageing uh, population in the treatment space at any rate, so it, it uh, just reflects on that. Now they're using a range of opioids. It is far and away the people are registered on there because of dependence to heroin, so 37%. Um, throughout Australia. The next um, substance identified was down in a single digit, so like 6% or something like that. But there are all those other pharmaceutical opioids that people are identifying as being their um, primary drug of concern as well. And also methadone is the most common, um, oh, there's an error in spelling or grammar there, common uh, pharmacotherapy used uh, across Australia, except for Queensland and Northern Territory. Uh, where it's actually the buprenorphine naloxone preparation. Um, so in Queensland, we have about 47% of buprenorphine naloxone, 42 of methadone, and 11 of buprenorphine. All right, so that's how things look kind of for opioid treatment in Queensland and in general what we do. But now we're back to opioid uh, substitution treatment in correctional centres. And I'll just clarify here, I'm calling it OST. In, in the correctional centres, it's opioid substitution treatment. I know there are a lot of other names out there, whether it be replacement therapy, um, uh, replacement treatment, things like that. But OST is what I'm going to keep going back to. So in Queensland, um, actually Australia-wide, it has been something that has been in correctional settings for many years. So particularly in Victoria and New South Wales, uh, they're looking at before 2000, you know, the, the treatment systems have been going down there. But in 2001, for those of you who can remember, there was a trial in Queensland. We had that at Brisbane Women's and it was also up in Townsville. Now after that first year of trial ran and there were some good results, but it was a short trial. Um, it was um, not continued on in, in uh, funding at the time to go out across the state. It continued on in Brisbane Women's uh, Correctional Centre. So they continued a program there. And that program continued really for um, ladies coming in on maintenance, uh, pregnant people, uh, the ladies that were pregnant, and for those pre-release where they were at high risk and, and having maybe pre-release before they, they got out of corrections to come back into community. 
Between then and now, uh, or between them and say 2016, there had been a number of recommendations going forward to suggest that it needed to go out throughout Queensland. In 2007, there was a coronial inquiry into the death of a, a prisoner, Fitzgerald, um, and in that inquiry, uh, the prisoner died from an overdose of heroin while in a correctional facility. And the outcome of that was to suggest that we needed opioid substitution treatment throughout Queensland Correctional Centres. Uh, fast forward to 2016, and after many people working on uh, trying to get this across the line beforehand and to promote it again, we got to the Queensland Parole System Review. One of those recommendations, there were um, 91 of them I think, 89 of them were, were um, accepted by the government, and recommendation 31 was essentially that Queensland Corrective Services and Queensland Health implement opioid substitution treatment across all Queensland prisons. So, there's going to be new funding for health service delivery. That includes prescriber, nursing, in some of the bigger centres, some admin support because um, you know some of them aren't, we have some very big centres and some smaller ones, um, and some nominal equipment. And it was going to be a phased implementation. So that phasing was going to start in the north and then look at some, uh, some of the other centres across the state. But when we looked up north, there's the, um, the centre at uh, Mariba, Lotus Glen, which is a male facility. And in Townsville, we had Townsville men's, but we also had Townsville women's. So when we're going to look at doing Townsville women's, it seemed natural just to make sure that we closed off on all of the female facilities around the state, which is what has happened. Um, and also just to note on that with the funding as well, it is for the correctional setting. So quite often people think, is there, you know, is that funding also to, to help um, in community services, watch houses, things like that? It was actually just for the, the um, correctional setting. So we had the evidence of why we use opioid substitution treatment in um, in general, in community, but we also have some evidence around why it's used or why it's beneficial in correctional centres, and a lot of it's the same. So we know that it's going to reduce the level and frequency of in-prison injecting and therefore sharing of equipment while they're in prison because we know that that is an issue and certainly an issue around the spread of blood-borne viruses. So we have a reduced risk of spread of those. We do have a reduction in mortality um, during incarceration, but specifically and more and importantly that um, on the outside so when people are released and there's that high risk period in the, la the first four weeks of being released and typically because people have lowered tolerance of um, the, to opioids compared to when they might have used in the past and they're at a high risk of overdose so it has a protective factor there. Certainly in prisons it helps with reducing drug seeking and that ties in then as well with the violent and aggressive behaviours. So with the drug seeking and with the drug use come some of those kind of standover tactics and you know um, debts are owed um, creates issues within a prison system and violent and aggressive behaviours. And it also has some effect on recidivism but the research if some of you have read some of the research so if they've looked at some random controlled trials some of the evidence is, is a bit equivocal but when they've done some long-term observational studies looked back at linking 22-year kind of history uh, linked studies they have shown that there is a reduction in um, in recidivism and particularly in, there was one in New South Wales that showed a 20 percent reduction in recidivism um, but a couple of the key things that have come out in these papers is that in that one in particular, it needed to be the fact that they were in treatment in correctional centre, but they were retained in treatment when they got out. And that's a really big um, key part of it there, is that we keep them in, in treatment, which is where the, why um, I really like to stress that connection between treatment in the, the service, uh, correctional centre and making sure that we get them to where they need to go um, when they're out. And that's hard to do. That's a def definitely a difficult thing to do. Um, and some recent research that's come out has also shown um, a reduction in reincarceration with people, and particularly when they're not cycling in and out of treatment. So when they've got longer term and stable treatment, so not dropping off and then starting again dropping off, there is a reduction in reincarceration there as well. So there are some good um, benefits, or, or there are benefits to um, providing it to, our pris to the prison population. So we set about by having to develop a model of service. 
As you're aware, the um, MATOD guidelines or Medication Assisted Treatment of Opioid Dependence Queensland guidelines um, are the key to providing um, or the, the guideline to providing treatment within Queensland and that doesn't change in the correctional setting. All we needed to do was make a model of service that was nuanced to the setting and probably took a bit more of a cautionary approach to how we did things as well. So we um, got an advisory group who informed of some of the, the initial development and then went out to some consultation a couple of times to get it refined to where it is for that phase one implementation to, to start off on all the centres that were going out first of all. In that, there was a couple of things that came out as well. We were certainly after looking at both maintenance in the model. We wanted to do both maintenance treatment and we wanted to look at initiation. So maintenance while people, um, if they're entering the correctional facility and they were on treatment in the community, they're a priority to keep going when they end up in the correctional centre and we want to keep them, that them on treatment. And initiation, um, we certainly want to look at those people that needed to be on treatment, were in prison, but weren't, didn't have that opportunity previously and we need to initiate them. And we'll look at some of the, the criteria for those in a minute. Um, and we also, in the model, were quite clear that we wanted to make sure we were using all of the medications that were available. Okay, um, so we developed that, uh, the model of service and it went out to, um, for that first phase of implementation. But the clinical aspects then, um, as I said, maintenance, if people are coming in, we just need to confirm that they've got continued dosing in the community. It's not always the case and sometimes um, you recognise one of the uh, people that are involved in treatment uh, in OST is people going into cr to watch houses. That can be, a, a, depending on how long they're in a watch house, continued treatment uh, may not always be possible or might not have occurred. So, but what we're after is someone getting evidence that people have continued their treatment dosing in the community. When we look at the eligibility criteria for initiation, so these are people within the correctional centre who identify that they would like to be um, placed onto treatment um, and asked to be assessed for that purpose. So we look for dependence, but dependence isn't always necessarily there right now. It might be a previous diagnosis of dependence. They might not be currently using significant amounts to show like a physiological dependence right now. Um, previous registration on treatment always gives us an idea that, that they have um, dependence and so they're always at risk and particularly in that environment. When we talk about the at risk of opioid related harm and withdrawal, it's really looking at those people. So one of, in the correctional environment, one of the things that um, I was talking before about, there's a lot of introduction of say the buprenorphine and the loxone preparation. So people might have a choice of using something else on the outside, like their, their preference might be a methamphetamine. However, it's easier possibly for them to be getting a buprenorphine and an opiate product while they're in corrections. And that drug use does occur and in, depending on where people are and their accessibility to those drugs can, hap hap can happen at a fairly regular um, occurrence so that they are at risk, high risk of harm while incarcerated. So bloodborne viruses, overdoses if they are mixing with other substances as well um, and other injecting related injuries or they're at harm of withdrawal. So if they come in and we know that they're on a significant kind of um, use of opioids and before coming into corrections and they're going through a significant withdrawal, then that's a good time for them to be initiated on something as well. Not a good environment to be in corrections if you're going through a withdrawal. Certainly it doesn't help with behaviour for, for the person when they're incarcerated, which means that they, there's possibly aggressive, agitated behaviour, um, it doesn't work well when you're in those environments, there's crowding, we know that as well. Um, other parts of the environment that can be quite stressful for them and it can cause them to act out and be problematic for uh, the rest of the environment. Consent to treatment, I will go over just some of those points in a second, so they obviously need to consent. In absence of contraindications and with adequate time, we just want to make sure that we can actually get them on a stable dose before they're released back to community. So sometimes people might like to go onto a treatment program and they might be um, uh, appropriate to go on a program, but if they only have a couple of weeks before they're being released and they might be 
say going on to methadone, we might not be able to get them onto a nice stable dose and that can still put them at risk when they come out because they're not on a stable dose. So we like to, um, to make sure that we've got enough time to get them onto the program. So consent to treatment. This requires, like it does in community as well, it does require a conversation with them, but this conversation is slightly different. So we are talking about how it impacts on life in prison. Um, we, people in prison are doing some industry work at times. We need to make sure that they're aware while they're stabilising that they might not be able to engage in that industry. Um, so it can impact on that part of it for them. It also because of the way that in correctional environments it's such a scheduled day for everything to happen and everything to operate effectively, um, they need to be um, aware of some of those restrictions on, on other things that they can do or what might impact on when they get their dosing as well. Um, other things that happen in prisons might actually dictate when they get their dose, so someone might normally get their dose at 10 in the morning but if there's some lockdown situation or some other operational uh, situation going on that takes precedence at the time, that dose might not come till an up to the afternoon. Um, so they don't have as much control over that as they might have in community. Obviously we talk about like uh, any time additional drug use risks um, and particularly because there is a lot of uh, use of random substances um, which almost goes to passing time away. Um, standing, standover and violence. So there are many reasons that standover and violence occurs in the correctional um, environment. Some of it is for um, the fact that people want the substance themselves. They're wanting to, to actually get something from using the substance. Some of them might not be on treatment and need to be in treatment but trying to get the substance. Sometimes it's paying back debt, sometimes it's making some money. Uh, but we need to let them know about ways to protect themselves from standover and violence and also communicating that with the health, the health staff and the corrections staff um, so that they can be assisted to have the proper treatment and be safe as well. There is a range of rules, rights and responsibilities and um, some of these come down to, just as I'll give an example of just some of the categories that we look at, but restricted items, so people aren't allowed to bring extra items to where they're being dosed. Clothing is a particular um, issue as well, so uh, people are restricted on certain items of clothing, the way hair is done, um, not being able to wear extra armbands or anything, so any way that could be used to divert a dose is also essentially eliminated. Um, personal presentation and conduct, so good conduct at all times. So this is something that still occurs in community, um, but really stepped through in, in the consent form uh, with patients. They're also informed of how the dosing procedure will go through and, and how they need to follow that dosing procedure. Um, and again, it's something different, that's, so they wouldn't be used to it because it's not the same in community. Um, and they need to be aware of what the processes are so that they agree to that when they go into treatment. Um, the next part I think is important, information sharing with QCS. This actually just means that we are talking with QCS because without the collaboration between the two teams, between custodial officers and the health team, the people won't get dosed. So if they're not aware, the officers have to be aware that someone is on an opioid treatment program because they're providing the security, they're providing a safe environment, they're doing the observational part to ensure that diversion doesn't or to reduce the risk of diversion. So they have to know. And again, the, the client going on to treatment has to be aware of that and it has to accept that as a condition of, of treatment. We also look to and talk to them about availability on release. Some people are going to places where they can't find a prescriber or where they can't find a dosing point. And we don't really want to set them up to be in a position when they're released where they've got nowhere to go. So we need to really consider what's happening with those people. Um, if we can get them maybe into some other drug and alcohol treatment while they're in corrections, um, or if there's some other way we can look at uh, providing them with, with assistance. But it goes into consideration of whether or not they go on a program. Talk to them about the cost and release, uh, uh, on release for daily dosing. As you're all aware, it's a significant cost. And particularly when they're coming out of corrections, it's not only a cost, but it's that demand of getting there, like working out how they're going to get to the pharmacy in the first instance, the cost of getting there and the cost of treatment. So it's a, a big issue for them to consider. 
Also, the usual obligations informing community doctors if you're seeking controlled or restricted drugs that you're on a program. And also, the, there's going to be some information sharing with community health because we want to make sure that we have a good clinical transfer between correctional um, teams, health teams, and the teams that are going to take over care on the outside. So, in the correctional environment, it's a little bit different system than it might be in community. Um, they are considered one, one system. So on entry into a correctional environment, you'll see up there in the green, um, whether it's maintenance or initiation, it is the correctional facility that first registers them. They, that's where they get registered the once and only time on that period that they're in correctional centre. So it doesn't matter how many correctional centres they might get moved to, and that happens a lot, um, there's no need for those clinics to be doing a discharge form and an admission form every time. It's a closed kind of circuit of treatment, so there's less risk of someone going somewhere else and getting a dose somewhere else because they're under two um, correctional centres registered at the same time. The only other movement that then really happens is if they're going to watch house, and that might be if they've got a court appearance or something like that. The correctional, the correctional team that is looking after them at the time when they go will take care of their treatment and they'll provide any um, written instructions to the watch house if treatment is required overnight. But that all depends on what, what the situation is with the watch house as well. Um, and then finally, the correctional team that is discharging the patient is the one that you know, to release to liberty. They're the ones that actually complete the, that whole registration or deregistration. So that process is complete. And they're the ones that provide all of the transfer information to the team on the outside. You can see there, there are a number of touch points where even though in the closed circuit, there are a number of touch points where communication is vital. So good documentation, really good communication, working with the teams where you're sending um, people to or receiving them is absolutely key in making sure that they're getting timely um, provision of service and, and not destabilising them unnecessarily. Um, recognising that there are circumstances that happen all the time that you cannot account for, but we don't want unnecessarily destabilize, to destabilise people by just not doing the paperwork or connecting them where they need to be. And in our system, the last part I just wanted to flag is that the, we're doing some monitoring and evaluation. So certainly we're rolling out in, in phases, but we also want to just look at um, what's happening across the board. So what medications are we looking at mainly? What ones are we using compared to some of the other states? Um, how long is it taking us to get to treating people? So time between when they put their hand up for assessment and when we're getting to them. It helps us see if we've resourced enough or whether there's some strains on the system. Um, also people were wanting to know how, who have put their hand up and have been assessed but they're not eligible for OST and we want to know why as well. So is it because they're, they actually need some treatment but it's for something else that's not actually for OST and is there some lacking um, in other service provision that might be required? So it helps us just to form a bit more of a picture and you'll see also in their location. So there is, there is um, talk and, and a lot of people in community services have probably been discussing this and the impact that opioid substitution treatment in our centres will have on community services and we're just really not sure. You might get some people that are now staying on treatment so rather than dropping off they might stay on because they can continue on in, in the prisons, in the correctional centres. Um, so there might not be a huge fluctuation but there also might be and we need to know maybe where they're going to so that if we can see there's a lack of, of resources in those communities and if we might need to target some um, some sort of activity to in, improve the connection at that end. Okay. So that's, that's basically the core of what we're doing. And um, I'm going to look at some of the enablers and some of the barriers which talk about the processes in the correctional centre as well. Um, but that's essentially what we're doing. And it is just opioid substitution treatment in a correctional environment. But where we're at right now, so we've completed stage, stage one. I said we're in our phase one. We're in implementation phases. So last year, as I said, Brisbane Women's, so in West Morton, Brisbane Women's has been doing this for many years and for that key groups that I, that I pointed out earlier. But what they have done now is expanded those services. So they are doing more initiation as well, not just looking at those, those key groups of pre-release or pregnant uh, initiation of pregnant prisoners. So they expanded last year. And Gold Coast um, 
in Gold Coast HHS is the Numan Bar Correctional Centre, which is a female low security centre. Now, they have also been taking on um, patients on OST for years because pe the uh, women will typically transition from Brisbane Women's to Numan Bar, and so they've been accepting people on a maintenance program for a number of years. So this wasn't exactly new to them, but what they've been able to do is expand their services to initiate some people as well. Um, I just want to point out as well, there, there was a bit of a movement last year, and you probably were aware that the Southern Queensland Correctional Centre, which was previously a male facility, was recommissioned to female facility, and that took a lot of movement of prisoners uh, away from Brisbane Women's and some down from Townsville into Southern Queensland Correctional Facility. Um, Brisbane Women's was um, involved heavily with that kind of program, um, and what they were able to do in working with Southern Queensland is um, manoeuvre some of those patients on a maintenance program over to Southern Queensland, who now uh, independently operate um, opioid substitution treatment as well, and Southern Queensland being currently a, um, a privately operated facility. The other centres in a Phase 1 status are in Cairns and Hinterland HHS. We have the Lotus Glen Correctional Centre. Um, in Mariba, or outside of Mariba. So that commenced in August last year. Um, they've had some really good results as well. So in that first um, part of feedback that we were getting from, from them, they were having um, uh, their patients handing in injecting equipment. Um, I think they probably had about five or six pieces that were handed in at some stage. Some of the correctional officers were reporting back at the time as well that they were getting better behaviour and some less prisoner on prisoner violence as well. So there were some good results happening up there to start off uh, the service. And then in Townsville, um, both Townsville uh, men's and women's facilities, uh, they were started in February this year. So they've had some recruitment difficulties there and that's one of the, the stumbling or a, a challenge that we've had in some of these areas employment of, of experienced staff or staff in general is really hard and you're probably all aware in alcohol and drug services that getting experienced staff is, is quite difficult even more so when you might get to a, a more regional remote area and when you combine it in a correctional environment. Now the uh, commencement of female uh, dosing at the female facility at Townsville this year means that we now have a complete kind of um, service delivery across all female correctional centres in Queensland. So that was the last piece of, of filling in that kind of part of the puzzle this year, which is fantastic. Um, the other facility that you'd be aware of is um, Helena Jones. Um, for a number of years it's quite low security and they've been on uh, treatment services and they work with Metro North, typically Metro North uh, Hospital and Health Service to uh, provide treatment for those uh, women that have come out of uh, the centres on treatment and continue on when released. So I'm going back to NOPSAD and just to look at the correctional centres and uh, what's happening in correctional centres across Australia. So last year 3,400 people were in correctional centres being treated with opioid substitution treatment and that equated for about 7% of all opioid substitution treatment patients nationwide. When we, excuse me, when we look at um, some of the other states, um, say for instance New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, they're all in that 6 to 9% as well, so the population on opioid substitution treatment in correctional centres is about 6 to 9% of their opioid treatment. And you'll see there that I put up last year um, when this snapshot was taken, so we had commenced services, we were up to 73 people, so that was more than just Brisbane Women's and Numb and Bar continuing theirs. Um, and, um, but that only equates to about, at that time, 1% of opioid treatment patients. So you can see that this is somewhere obviously that, that Queensland needs to build and that obviously will happen as we um, implement further and as their numbers start to increase and the teams get on top of um, the numbers that they need to see. And interestingly as well, um, maybe not, mostly methadone. So we are talking about some of those features of methadone and, and buprenorphine in the past. Um, so across Australia, 86%. Again, if you look to um, some, of the, some of the states, uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia, South Australia, they range between 80 and 99% of methadone in, in correctional centres. Northern Territory is none. Um, Tasmania is 8%. And we sit at about 30% um, for methadone. 
So the majority of ours uh, in Queensland, out of that 73, we had 63 on buprenorphine naloxone, seven on methadone, and three on buprenorphine. Um, the, I guess some of the experience in some of the other centres is that they, um, certainly there is a couple of things. There is that history of diversion, and other states have experienced that in the past. And there is um, less incidence, I guess, in reporting on diversion with methadone than there is of buprenorphine. However, methadone is still diverted and attempted to be diverted. Um, and also one of the things that um, reflected back to me when I've talked to some of the other jurisdictions as well is that um, obviously methadone is a bit more timely in actually administering uh, the medication. So the time that it is taken uh, for sometimes for the buprenorphine naloxone or buprenorphine to dissolve sublingually um, and because those people are being observed, because we're trying to reduce the diversion, so they're under strict observation for a set period of time, um, that can actually really delay time factors. When you're working in a correctional environment, that can be really problematic. So, I just wanted to talk, kind of wrap up on some challenges that we've had over the last couple of years and some of the things that were really good. Um, for me, some of, the, some of the, the hard parts were looking at local organisational structure and governance. So within hospital and health services, um, sometimes um, it's really good that offender health and mental health, alcohol and other drug services fall within the same delivery service group or delivery line, and in others it doesn't. And I found that where they do fall in the same line, sometimes it's easier to get some coordination happening between those services. Because even though it's offender health providing the treatment service and the funding is, is with them to, to put on the treatment team, we still want them to be able to link in with the alcohol and drug services in community because that's their, their main uh, support and probably one of the places that they're going to transfer most of their people to when they're released or take them in from. So that can be problematic. Um, you're all aware that the environment is under pressure from escalating prisoner numbers and this is not just in Queensland, um, there's an inquiry going on in New South Wales at the moment and I think I saw them report something like a 40% increase over the last five years or something like that down there. It's something that's happening uh, across the country. Um, really problematic and it also it impacts on prisoner movement during the day, um, on the facilities are available, like the fact that healthcare is, you know, then being spread over an increasing amount of, of um, prisoners, but the healthcare might not have been able to increase as well. And even though we're providing new funding for health teams, it doesn't change the fact that they're all under pressure as it is. Infrastructure limitations or real estate, um, when I've certainly been out there to experience it and something I never realised before, um, and probably I knew but you don't consider it. The space that the health centres have is sometimes really restricted and particularly in some of the older centres and cost of building or developing new centres and, and new parts of correctional facilities is, is quite costly um, and doesn't happen overnight. So some of these teams are working out of small areas and then this is another service that's being provided on top. Something that Brisbane Women's found out um, when their numbers started to increase over the years was that they couldn't also just drive this program out of the health centre as it existed. So the service became more of a mobile service, which is something that we've replicated across the state. Um, and certainly when I've gone out and walked around with the teams doing that, if I had a, um, I don't know, a Fitbit or something on, I would have got my steps up for a week in some of the centres. Um, the mobile services do go out around the whole centre. But when you think about it then, that increases the time to get dosing to all of the people. It's a resource intensive because you've got the health staff, you've got the custodial staff that are also going out with that team, and you're walking around many, like many aspects of the centre with lots of gates to get through, lots of possible delays, other operational issues that are going on in this town. Uh, this correctional centre that actually can slow the process down. So it is time intensive. Recruitment, as I said before, in some areas it's, it has been um, difficult. Staged implementation, there's two aspects to this. Correctional centres have an, have an issue because they can't um, move people that are on treatment program to a facility that doesn't provide treatment. 
So where they might want to, or that, that uh, prisoner may want to actually go to a different um, correctional centre for industry because they can get, um, or they've got a treatment program there, but if they don't have opioid substitution treatment, they can't be moved. So there's some restriction on, on um, prisoner movement there that needs to be dealt with by QCS. And also pre, uh, the patient expectations um, is an issue. So there's talk. Lots of talk that goes on in the correctional environment and the, the prisoners would talk to you, they're waiting for it, they know it's coming, my mate's in a different facility, he can get it there, why can't I? So there's all of that and actually managing that prisoner expectation and being realistic with them so that they, they're not having a, you know, maybe a set date that they're expecting it and then if there are other complications to getting it started um, that might delay that. Farms, work camps and watch houses, they are logistical, <laughs> I'd like to actually, they are logistical nightmares um, and the resources for those. When I'm talking obviously watch houses, um, there are a number of them throughout the state, um, there, we do not have health, health resources in the watch houses to be able to provide this um, service. Work camps are often in places where there are no facilities to go dosing, so they don't necessarily need a prescriber, they need someone to dose uh, or somewhere to dose and they're not always available and the, the other supporting structure to get them to where they need to be for dosing doesn't always exist as well. So we're working on, on that and looking at ways to improve that. And when I talk about the farms, it's not necessarily the low security ones that are uh, kind of standing on their own with their own health facilities. It's the ones that are in a, for want of a better word, a campus of the, the high security centres um, and the health team go from the high security part to the low security farm to be able to provide health services and again uh, getting from the main centre out to where they need to be to take the treatment out to the people is really difficult and it's a daily basis thing as well so a few issues there. Um, stigma is um, you know it's something that we deal with across the community we deal with it in the centres as well. It's something that is I think can be broken down through education, through talking, through allowing people to, to talk about their concerns. Sometimes it comes through fear or just not knowing or having misinformation. Um, and, and you just need the opportunity to start to break that down and maybe correct some of that information if you, you've got the chance. So it's something that um, certainly we used our educa education and training resources to target and then also just the project um, team, which myself and a colleague from uh, QCS going out and talking to people at the sites. Going to the other, the other end then when transferring to our community, the problems, the, the challenges are a lack of access. So there is just a lack of primary healthcare providers who might be able to offer treatment. Then if they are, and we know that this is a cohort of priority and they're identified as a high priority in both our METOD guidelines and we re, um, reaffirm that in the, the model of service, it still doesn't um, change the fact that community services are under pressure. Some of them are already have waiting lists to get people on, and so they're having to manage that. Um, we've tried to assist there in the, in the length of time that we allow people to, the prescribers from the correctional centres, to provide dosing at clinical, at pharmacies until they can get into a treatment service. So we're looking at ways that we can do that while keeping it as safe as possible. Um, but it's definitely an issue. And certainly one of the big issues which w will be a struggle to overcome is when some of the, um, the patients are released quickly. So they might have a presentation at court and the magistrate might release them or they might have a parole board hearing and unexpectedly, unexpectedly released. And if I talk to people about this, they'd mostly say it happens on a Friday night. Um, but that person then is released not to return back to the centre. And if the, connection <coughs> if the connection and transfer of care hasn't occurred already, the person's out in community and looking for somewhere to get a dose and get treatment. So that's a vulnerable point. Um, it's a big challenge and we're certainly looking at ways that we can tidy that up as well. We're certainly aware of it. But in all of that there are some fantastic things and I'm remiss, sorry, the first one up there I put departmental and HHS collaboration. I also need to put in there the correctional centre um, collaboration as well. I certainly wouldn't have been able to 
um, have such um, an experience of going through and getting some of this implemented if it wasn't for the general managers at the correctional centres and the support that they have provided in both the program and um, our team trying to get it implemented as well. But across the board, from me working with the, um, uh, me and, and my team working with the Queensland Corrective Services um, and going out to HHS and in the correctional centres, collaboration is the strongest part that has got this through. We know opioid substitution works. Um, we know that you know it's a treatment that exists. We don't need to prove any of that again. We just need to make sure that our collaboration is really strong to make it work in this particularly nuanced environment. Town hall meetings are held in correctional centres and they're a way that we could go out and talk to the staff within a correctional centre and give them an opportunity to voice concerns, ask questions, um, answer some of those, hopefully demystify some of it. Um, as I was saying before, take away some of those myths if we can as well. And when we're on the site, walking around and giving the opportunity for people to ask us questions in what I hope was a um, a non-confrontational kind of environment because it's their environment and we were standing there um, to see them in their environment. Local working groups are something that occur um, and were put to good use in when corrections um, took smoking out of uh, correctional centres a few years ago and so we kind of tried to replicate that and it's a combination of all of the people involved in running the correctional centres so it's the QCS staff, it's the, um, the health staff, if um, there was some drug and alcohol from community representation in some of them or mental health and just coming together and making sure that all the pieces that need to be put together to operate within the correctional centre and that means how they operate it in a day, what times things get done, what staff need to be where, all of that is talked about and sorted out to implement appropriately. Um, I, could, I could bang on forever about champions we know that they're absolutely important in getting something like this through. And if the champions aren't there, some of those myths and the fears can keep rising. So we need champions to be there and to stay there so they're always kind of fighting the battle for us. I've talked about education and training. Insight have been um, really uh, helpful to us on this respect. Um, they helped develop some um, videos for us and online guidelines and tools that have been very useful for both the health staff but also the corrective staff. Um, and without them, we really wouldn't have moved along as quickly as we have. So they've been fantastic and they've also just recently um, released their opioid treatment prescriber training as well, which is a fantastic package, really good information and, and obviously I promote that for people that want to become opioid prescribers out there in the community or to work in corrections. Um, won't too much about the last bits. We kept doing readiness assessments and looking at, at plans to pick up on anything that wasn't ready. Readiness assessments covers off on everything like communication to, pay, to the prisoners, communication to health staff, communication to corrective services staff, um, to um, the, the infrastructure that's available and the equipment that's required and the processes to be set up. So we would look at all of that and set up plans if things weren't ready and regular reporting. Okay, so to complete the picture, um, for us it's getting that standard care of opioid treatment out across the centres. So we're through implementation um, of phase one. These are all the centres that are to, to go um, for the next uh, for future rollout and where we currently stand is uh, so the plan was after implementation of phase one that government would look at how that went and see if we need to um, to consider the future implementation on, and how we look at implementing the future rollout and that's where we currently stand at the moment. So the government's looking at um, a more of a through care model of service delivery for in this environment because there's some other aspects in the rehabilitation of, of the remandees and prisoners that they want to also address. So we're currently working um, again with Queensland Corrective Services to drive that through care. So we've got the, getting this in will give us that standard care and then we need to connect all those dots to make sure that the picture is complete and we don't have those vulnerable points. Okay. I don't know if I have time for questions. That might have been good timing for me. But are there any questions? Thank you very much. I'm bothered yes. about the, I'm just still wondering about the difference with um, 
privately run correctional facilities that have shareholders and profits in mind? Yeah, the, um, certainly when the um, government indicated that we were going to, that this was a commitment that we were going to do, certainly the private centres needed to provide um, service that was consistent with the public health services. Um, but you would um, also probably be aware of the announcement that the private centres are moving to public um, operation as well. So, but certainly, um, the private centre at, um, at Southern Queensland Correctional Centre um, was certainly very good at, at um, getting their service up and running expediently when they had the recommission for the female prison population. in far north Queensland and down here with working women who are pregnant and the, just the understandings of the clinical guidelines around antenatal and neonate and, and RRT. You know, in health facilities, the availability of, of um, dosing, the prescribers, but also dosing, even in regional areas, not not the not talking remote, and that, that issues of consistency particularly in pregnancy and, and yep. moving from that you're not on a, any, you're not on a prescription in the community and, uh, and then you're in a health service uh, and you're identified as, as you know, in withdrawal and yeah, that, that's, I just, I just one, it's not really a question but it's sort of, I see huge gaps uh, there for, for um, continuation of that. Certainly, and, and look, yeah, certainly that the vulnerable points, as I was saying before, they're the touch points of people being able to get from one service to the other. Um, and I can't speak highly enough of just good documentation, really good clinical transfer of care. Um, it's imperative. Um, I know everyone is busy, um, but, you know, services have forms and documents that can provide really good information succinctly they just need to make their connections and they need to make sure that they're doing it and clarifying at both sides. So clinicians need to be practicing good uh, clinical transfer or handover. And uh, it's something that we, certainly we try to promote. Um, and as I said before, sometimes things do fall down and not everything is accounted for and, and things pop up. But you're right, it is a, it is a vulnerable point. Um, and making sure that there is access to resources, to dosing points, to, to clinicians where they need them is very difficult as well. Um, and it's certainly been a struggle over a number of years to make sure that those services are there. Um, interestingly, when you look at things like, you know, even in dosing points, if you looked at, I know as a clinician coming from, one of our biggest issues was always dosing points. But if I look at the NOPSAD data from last year, Queensland actually does really well on our pro rata basis of how many dosing points per, per patient that they have compared to other states. We don't have the same reflection in our prescribers, so um, our ratio of patients to prescribers isn't as good as some of the other states. And so there are obviously nuanced issues across the state and different areas suffer differently for different reasons. Um, and awareness is always, uh, I think, people being aware of what their local environment is and then just providing that support so that people aren't left to make, to connect the dots themselves. It's really difficult to um, get around the health system, to any system really, um, and we need to be, the clinicians need to be making those connections for people. I don't know if that, no, well, I, it's, it's yeah. a concern, I agree. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Thanks, Beacon. Um, you joining me in thanking you for this.